Hello and welcome to Special People, Extraordinary Times. This is one of those programs where we have explored the experiences of two servicemen, um, Julie Margolis, who served in the Pacific, and Saul Schechter, who served in Europe. During World War II, um, the United States actually fought in what felt like two different wars because it was a world war because every, every country in the world was involved except the very few who remained neutral. But we were involved in a war against Germany in Europe and a war against Japan in the Pacific. Julie Margolis served in, um, in the Pacific, in the Army. Saul Schechter served in Europe, also in the Army. And these are their stories. Let's look at Julie Margolis' story. I, th I had tried to get out of the infantry so many times. I volunteered for the paratroopers for the glider troopers. Oh my. I, I volunteered for everything and anything just to get out of the infantry, but they wouldn't accept me. When we got to Hawaii and asked for swimmers, I thought they were looking for people like the Carson's Raiders. I don't know if you're aware of them. They were the, the, the crew that went to Macon Island as, with a submarine. And they were underwater swimmers. I figured that's what I'm volunteering for, not me. I ended up in, the, in Schofield Barracks learning how to be a swimming instructor. <laughs> I had to teach combat swimming. That means swimming in burning oil, how to make flotillas out of your clothing and whatever is around. And when we trained in the landings, we would sit on these big rubber rafts and, and watch to see that nobody drowned. And every time there was a break in combat, we were assigned to lifeguard duty. But before that, we had to teach swimming. And people will be amazed to learn that the percentage of Americans that didn't know how to swim in World War II was like 50% of Americans couldn't well, swim. Because if, uh, if you don't live on the coast where there's an ocean where you can learn to swim. Of course. You know. Where do you learn? You live in the middle of the country in Nebraska. Where are you going to in swim? In the bathtub, you cannot learn to breastfeed. So we had to learn to teach, and we taught. I became a, a swimming instructor, one of, of five, and it was like a hundred of guys that went out. The rest became lifeguards, and we had a training program. We, we taught because we were amphibious. We were going to be on the water. Sure. And we, and we were given a commendation for that, for the amount of people we taught how to swim. Except whenever there was a break in combat, everybody got to go swimming, and we sat as lifeguards. <laughs> that, that, that wasn't the worst of it. The worst of us was you got wounded. Yes, I was. Tell me about that. OK, before I got wounded, I, we were in, we fought in Guam. We didn't make the initial landing in Guam. We were the backup troops to the, to the Marines. They, they were the initial ones, but we were the finalists. We cleaned out the island. We went to where, where no Marines had gone. It was a bad scene. It was, wow. the, it was our training. There's where you learn that combat isn't such a pleasant thing. Sure. From there, we went to the Philippines. We landed in Leyte. Again, we didn't make the initial landing in Leyte. But we were used for the second landing. We went around to Ormoc, which is the other side. And that's, that's where we landed and fought. And we were going through you know, the inland. We were, go, we were on the attack. And the scouts were out looking for the, for, to see what was what. So meantime, I was in, I must preface everything. I was in the heavy weapons company, which was a mortar platoon and two machine gun, 30 caliber water cool machine gun platoons. I was in the machine gun platoon. I was a first gunner. I was a first gunner for over three years. 
I wouldn't take a promotion when they offered me PFC. In the beginning, I said, I don't want nothing. I don't want nothing to hold me here. I want to get out. Not out of the army, out of the infantry. I want to get to the air corps, but never could make it. Well, we were landed in the, in the second landing in, in Leyte. We were going around you know, to, to encircle the Japs. So our scouts were out, and I was sitting there next to the machine gun, smoking a cigarette. And all of a sudden, bing, I felt like something hit me in the leg, like a, somebody hit me with a bat. I said to the guys, I think I got shot. So I called the medic over, and he started to tear open my pants. He says, oh, here it is. I said, it doesn't hurt there. He said, well, it goes a little high. He said, oh, here's where it is. I said, that doesn't where it hurts. He went all the way up to my thigh, and then we found where the bullet had entered and gone through. Now they, they asked me, the corpsman asked me, and in the army he was a medic, and the navy was a corpsman. He asked me, he says, can you do it out the codeine? That way it happened. <laughs> and from there they moved me to a, a, a field hospital. From there they put me on an LSD and moved me out to a hospital ship. Hospital ship took me down to the Admiralty Islands. The Admiralty Islands, they flew me to Guadalcanal, and that's where I stayed until they shipped me back to my outfit to go into Okinawa. And then we went to Okinawa, and after Okinawa, we went back to Japan. We went to Cebu this time to prepare for the landing in Japan, to get all set. And uh, I already gave up hope. I thought I'd never come home because I figured the odds are against it. How many times can you go in and come out? Yeah. How many times can you be in, in danger? And thank God for Truman. He ended the war. So anybody who thinks that the A-bomb was a cruel thing should have been in my shoes, yep. and he will see how cruel it was. Yep. And finally Saved see... Saved thousands of oh, boys' lives. When we landed in Japan, which is where we went from there, you could first realize how the casualties were. There weren't beaches, there were cliffs. You know, and we had trouble landing on beaches. Imagine on a cliff, how many guys would have And so you got, I got the, the Purple Heart. Yeah, that's an award. It's funny. I was in a hospital in Guadalcanal, and this, this general, Maxwell Murray was his name. I'll never forget him. He comes in and he tells you a joke, so you laugh. They take your picture, so you look happy. And he gives you a medal. <laughs> And then you got the Bronze Star. Yeah, that I got after I got out of the army. That was awarded to many, many infantrymen. But you guys were heroes. Well... Yeah, yeah, at a time when the world needed heroes, there you were. Yeah, we were there. We were ready for it. But the whole world, the whole, there wasn't anybody against it. That's true. It was this, a different this, time. Oh, it was so different. Everybody wanted to go. Everybody wanted to serve. Yet they felt it was their duty to serve. Yeah. And now, let's see the story that belongs to Saul Schechter. I went to Italy, and I was in a replacement depot. And that was something where every day I had to go down and look on the bulletin board in the company uh, uh, area and see if my name was on there to go up to join a, 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 an outfit. Anyway, Fifth Army was, was the army in Italy at the time. Mark Clark's Fifth Army. So finally, one day, <clears throat> and I was very fortunate because uh, I worked in the kitchen, I worked in a message center, I worked in the latrines. That's what I was doing until my name came up. Finally, one day, lo and behold, my name is on the on the uh, bulletin board, and I had to come out at five uh, oh five hundred the next morning, and uh, with all my gear, and I'm out in the middle of the company area and this six-by-six six truck comes up, and they take me and another young man from Tennessee. I didn't know him. He was a replacement also. And driving up to the front with this young man, with this kid, he's telling me he's from Tennessee. He's a real farmer boy, a nice young man, nice kid. And now we get to somewhere up in the front, and uh, they drop us off, the two of us, and a first sergeant comes over with a big notebook, and he says, uh, uh, what's your name, rank, and serial number? I give him my name, rank, and serial number. And as we're talking like that, all of a sudden I hear, whoosh, 
whoosh, and those, anybody who was in the army and knows the German 88s was the most sophisticated, powerful weapon known, and they were very accurate. And when this uh, buzz came over my head, the sergeant said, hit the ground, hide. And there was a hole there, I jumped into the hole, and this young man who was with me, this kid, <clears throat> he jumped into another hole about 20 feet away, and all of a sudden one of these shells came in and went right in that hole, and there was nothing left of this kid, oh, nothing. Hi. And the first sergeant, when it was all over, he came over and he was so angry, he says, look, I can't even make out my report. I don't know that kid's name, and I'm, he screwed up my whole paperwork. And I'm saying to myself, sometime next week, some sergeant is gonna come to this young man's parents' home, knock on the door and say, we regret to inform you that your son has been killed in action. It was such a traumatic thing for me to see that happen. So that's the story that I heard and saw when I was there was so, uh, it affected me tremendously. Now what happened, you have to understand, Italy was a very difficult campaign. Your, your victories were measured in, in hundreds of yards. In other words, it was a, Italy was a series of mountains. And what happened, we finally, we get to Bologna. And Bologna was so heavily mined that they said that that will never, never, in a hundred years, will ever be able to clear all the mines out. But we stayed back in the back area, and they had the engineer corps come in, and on their hands and knees, they had, on the road, they had about maybe 20 guys on their hands and knees, poking the ground and taking out mines. And when they had an area cleared through Bologna, now we all got in our trucks and we started driving. We did in one day, we did 75 miles. And that's when the war was over because we, we went so f we captured uh, German wax. We captured, uh, 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 what do you call it, with the horses, cavalry. Because, and the war was over, right, right when that happened, the war was over. So I was very fortunate that I had this one the serious. War the war in Europe. in Europe. And then what happened, they sent me back to Montecatini, which is a part of Italy, which was lovely, by the way. And um, they put me in a message center. And uh, my job there was to process other guys who were going to Japan. And I don't know how I got into that job, but they put me in there and I was, and I was processing. In fact, while I was there, I met, I met uh, a young man who was a friend of mine from Hart Street in Brooklyn. Wow. And he had put in three years in Italy, and now he was being shipped to Japan. When I came home, in, 19, in uh, January of 43, I was a seasoned adult. I married my late wife. We had a wonderful life together. And I said to myself, I say it now, I was 21 years old. I had seen everything, but it was a very interesting part of my life. And it was something when I came home, my parents were so happy. In fact, my father, when I left, my father had a heart attack because he knew what I was, and he died when he was 58 years old. This was part of our life, and I'm glad to be part of, I'm glad to be back, I'm glad to be here. These brave men and all of the service, men and women who fought in World War II, need a big round of, of thank yous from all of us. For OCTV, I'm Elaine Kugelman, and thank you for joining us today on this special edition of Special People Extraordinary Times.